this was episode 72 of the Clive Barker podcast. And in this episode, me and Ryan uh, talked to a friend of the podcast, actor and writer Nicholas Vince, author of What Monsters Do and his latest collection of short stories, Other People's Darkness. It, it was a very fun and deep interview, as you will see. And at the end of the, the interview, we also talk about the news regarding uh, the new Nightbreed comic book, um, a, a new release of a, a Clyde Barker book for The Nook, and other things. So I uh, uh, hope you enjoy this episode and uh, keep listening to the podcast. Thank you very much. How's it going? Fine, apart from the fact that I'm squeaking when I say hello. Hello. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Hi, Nico. Hi, hello. It's Jose and Ryan here. Hey. Hello, nice, Jose. Nice to talk to you again. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is episode thir- 72, and it's our third uh, third time talking with you on, on this podcast. Wow. 72 is an awful lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, We and we do these every other week, so... Um, so actually, we're on on our third year now. I was going to say yes. That's I was rapidly trying to do the maths. There. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So welcome. Um, it's it's Thank good you. good to talk to you again. And uh, and uh, I I had joined you on briefly on your um, Google Hangouts and Jose also uh, chattering with Nicholas Vint. Mm-hmm. So why did you decide to start doing those? I was very conscious of the fact that not everyone can get to see, to go to conventions. And particularly in the UK, I very seldom, I haven't actually done a personal appearance for over a year now, not since we did the last, actually I think the last one I did was in Birmingham when we did a screening of Hellraiser and Hellbound um, when I was with Ken Cranham. This was with the guys who were behind the, Le- the Leviathan documentary. Uh, right, very smart, right. and and his friends. Um, so there was that, and I also just genuinely like talking to people. Um, I really enjoy that, um, and yeah. it's just it, it's fun. And I, I'm always interested in new technology and new ways of reaching people, uh, and so on. And I'd also done a book club uh, meeting when I did what monsters do, um, where. Six very lovely ladies um, got together. Can they call themselves wine and literature off the top of my head? May I have that wrong? Sure. Um, sure. And it was just a really intro. It was a it was a great way to send um, uh, spend an evening, um, just listening to readers of the short stories and you know what they'd liked, what they hadn't liked, what confused them. Um, and it's a I think it's a very good thing for authors to do to actually speak to readers about their work. Um, Because I think, you know, you can only gain from it. Um, uh, Hopefully both sides can only gain from it. Um, So that was kind of the the idea behind them. Having done one, it proved popular. Um, People liked it. Uh, People also want to talk to me about Hellraiser as well as the writing, and that's totally Mm -hmm. fine. But also I'd rather liked, you know, what I managed to do on the second one was bring in London Horror Festival um, from Clare. Yeah. And, that's, and, that, and that's what I'd like to do with future ones, is bring on guests. Because I get to meet some really cool and interesting people and work with them, and I'm lucky enough to work with them as well. So Ashley Thorpe was supposed to join us on the last one. He's the director of Borley Rectory, mm. which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, uh-huh. We took technical issues with Ashley. Um, hopefully we're going to try and resolve those sometime this week um, so that we can double check that he can actually get on uh, for the next one. Um, and I really, you know, again, just talking to Claire was really fun. And I think people enjoyed that. Uh, I think Ashley will be fun. 
Um, I do have some other plans if if this goes well to kind of expand it, doing it on more, certainly doing it once a month um, to begin with. Um, and then like yourselves, if we, you know, if there's enough interest, then I'd probably do it every couple of weeks, but concentrating, oh, wow. concentrating on the interviewing people. Oh, wow. So um, it, it was a lot of fun. And uh, there was one thing I, that after we got done that I was thinking about, I mean, maybe this is just because this is what I'm used to, but I thought it would be really cool if you uh, captured the audio from those and syndicated it in an RSS feed uh, so that people you know, could subscribe like in a podcast. Oh, that would be very interesting. Yeah, I don't know if that's possible with Google Hangouts on air, mm-hmm. um, but you, though presumably I could capture it independently. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's. I use. You have. Do you have a Macintosh? I do. Yeah. So what I use is a program called. Um, not that we're doing an advertisement for them, but it's <laughs> w- Wiretap Studio. And, okay. And you can set it to just record all the audio on your computer, so you just would probably press play on on the YouTube video after you're all done, and then hit record on that, and it'll turn it into an MP3. That's really interesting. That is a very interesting idea because I was, I've been thinking of, um, and funny enough, I've been discussing with the guys behind London Horror Festival who are in investment, um, uh, Claire, Phil, and Peter, who and do the... The, the uh, Hellraiser podcast? She do the Hellraiser podcast. Yeah. And I was discussing the idea of doing a podcast um, because what I'd really like to do is do readings of the short stories. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, that would and, be great. Uh, yeah, and then and get those out as well. So I need to look into the oh, wow. kind of setting yeah. up a decent sound studio um, with you know in my home, mm-hmm. um, and started looking into that um, because obviously I need to get the right equipment, but also need to set up the probably could set up my study and and dampen it down and ask the neighbours not to be taking beds apart, which bless her cotton socks she had to do the other day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it tends to be rather noisy. I live in a you know a, a lively neighbor neighborhood. Um, <laughs> we tend to get a lot of extraneous noise. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things I'd really like to do because um, I think I enjoy you know acting, reading my own stories is uh, would be a fun thing to do. Um, yeah, I think well, that's great. I'd be interested in that. Mm-hmm. And you always have a lot of things going on. I mean, you have now uh, the Backpack movie by Mike Clark, and you have the Other People's Darkness cover photo competition. You did the trailer that we're going to add to this interview afterwards. So that, that also kind of engages people into being active and keeping up with, you know, keeping up with their favorite writer and actor. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I, I'm, and I do try and share as much as possible. I, on um, the... Uh, Google Hangout, I, was, I promised to actually set up a blog post um, on that evening. I should have realized that actually doing a Google Hangout is actually quite exhausting. <laughs> um, <laughs> I thought, great, I'll, I'll, I'll finish that. And then by nine o'clock, I was asleep. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, by 10 o'clock that night. I, yeah, no, nine o'clock. We finished at eight o'clock. And I was thinking, right, I'll have some dinner, had my dinner, and then nine o'clock is like, I'm asleep now. I can't do <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, so, it seems like it would be stressful with all those people and different like technical issues with having so many people on at one time. Yeah, I think um, Craig and I are kind of investigating how we can set it up so that he can take over the actual control and muting people and, and just, you know, and keeping an eye on that. Oh, that's smart. Um, yeah, that would be yeah, that would make it. Exactly. Yeah, so it's just a question of I'll probably you'll probably see me sitting in the bedroom now, so that he can work on the PC. Or other, oh, actually, he might be able to sit on the netbook. We're kind of, again, it's just a question of you know checking out because this is only the second time I've done it. Um, I'm kind of learning as I go. Um, yeah, it's 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 a really constant. Well, as you know, if you're even if you're just doing your ordinary podcast, you have to be. A, uh, I was reading an article. In fact, I just shared a, a link on my Facebook page, Alejandro. Jodorowsky, I'm probably pronouncing this incorrectly. Um, Jodorowsky, yeah. Yeah, Jodorowsky. Um, and he was saying you just have to be a thousand percent there when you're making a film. And I think it's the same for you when you do your podcasts and when I'm, I'm talking to you or if I'm doing Google Hangout or whenever you do these things, you have to be a thousand percent there. Um, Absolutely. And that takes energy. Um, and so on. So, what yeah. I was trying to say was, I have now published the blog. 
<laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> uh, which is um, <clears throat> top website. I, in fact, once we finish this, I'm going to start spreading the word that it's up. Um, is that on nicholasvince.com? It's on nicholasvince.com. And then if you just go to the journal tab, okay. it's the most recent in, uh, entry there. And basically, it's what I learned and what I wrote at a masterclass with a gentleman called Nicholas Royal, who, whose book, first novel I'm reading at the moment, is very in, it's very inter- it's very interesting. Um, a quick anecdote about that: this happened at the end of April. I went to this. It was the first time I'd ever been to this masterclass. Or this, it's all about short stories. It happens in London once a month. Um, it's called the Word Factory, and. Basically, there's a masterclass in the afternoon, and then in the evening, you get to listen to people who are um, uh, writers reading their short stories. Um, It was an absolutely fascinating afternoon, really, really interesting. And as I walked in, introduced myself to Nicholas, who was obviously the tutor, and he said, you're Nicholas Vince? I said, yes. (laughs) He said, "You're, you're an actor. You played Chatterer in Hellraiser. I'm going... Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> this never happens to me. <laughs> um, it turned out Nicholas, I knew I knew I recognized the name, but I couldn't place him when I signed up for the masterclass. Nicholas also wrote for a magazine called Fear, which published one of my early short stories, Look See, you know, my background, oh, yeah. Asherah. And Nicholas also wrote for that. In fact, he sent me a short story, which I haven't had a chance to read yet, which alludes to a set visit he made to Hellraiser. But Nicholas, it, it's a re- I'm really pleased with the, with the blog piece, and I think people find it interesting because he basically challenged us to write a short story in 20 minutes. Um, so I've given everybody the notes I made in that 20 minutes, because we then had to read it out. Um, mm. And there were about 15 of us in the class. And Nicholas just said at the end of it, he said, you know, you, really, you guys are really, really good. He was very complimentary about all, everyone's contribution. I think there's a really nice group of people, talented people coming to this thing now. Um, so anyway, that's now up on the website. So you get my notes and then you get my second draft. I know, Jose, you joined us later on on the Google Hangout. Yeah. One of the questions I often get is, how do you work? Um, so it's a bit about how I work, and it's it's a chance to actually share with people. Right. It was a question that was asked by Paul Fluid, I think, yeah. who's also a writer. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Um, so I kind of I kind of repeated some of the stuff I said in the Google Hangout, um, but you know, in terms of technically mm-hmm. what it is I do. Um, but also, I, I, it's interesting for me because I wrote it, but looking at the notes that I made during the. Um, those 20 minutes and the short story that you can get in a second draft. It's really interesting. And it was all based on an opening line. The, um, the workshop was called in the beginning. So it was all about how to start a story. Um, Oh, so it's, I think anyone who's interested in writing should find it very interesting. Um, yeah. So that's up. I, I, I usually visit this website called reddit.com and, uh, they have a, what they call a subreddit for writers, which is called, uh, writing prompts. So someone comes up with an idea, let's say, uh, you know, Calvin and Hobbes, like Calvin is on his deathbed and he talks to Hobbes one last time. So people have to come up with a paragraph with that idea and develop it into, uh, like a novel page. Sure. So it's interesting. I mean, you get a theme and then you have a certain amount of time, you go for it and people discuss which one is the best afterwards. So oh, interesting. Yeah. Be- the beginning is where you give the information, uh, where it takes place, when it's taking place, who are the characters and, you know, you engage the, the reader in the beginning of the story basically, and then you develop it throughout but uh, that sounds like a very fascinating project it was and and and, and it's very interesting you say that because one of the reasons that i went to the word factory was because i'd seen a gentleman at the london book fair called paul mcvey do a panel mm. and one of and it was all about short stories and short fiction and one of the guys uh, not paul had said on the panel you know, your first, your opening paragraph is exposition. And Paul immediately said, no, it shouldn't be. That's really boring. He said, I'll, I'll always put, stop reading a short story if I've got nothing but exposition in the first paragraph. He said, what you need is something that actually gives you a hook. 
that makes you interested. Right. And this is something that came out, you know, cover in the article, in the, uh, the blog piece, that actually there's two things that the, um, I don't want to give too much away, but the, yeah, read, read the blog piece. <laughs> it's not long. We will. It's not long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'll, we'll add that one to the show notes. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned that hook thing because that's uh, – once I saw uh, an interview with Clyde Barker where he stated that that's why he opened Hellraiser the way he did with the Cenobites coming over and Frank is all you know, ripped to pieces on the floor and we see the Cenobites in the, in the shadows and they kind of pick him up and then everything disappears and then we see a normal couple just walking into a house. That That's the hook that immediately sets you in. You want to know more about who's yeah. that guy with the pins? What happened to the guy that's ripped in pieces on the floor? What is going on? What you know? So sometimes the best thing to start a story is you start it with something that shocks and engages yeah. the audience, and then you got them hooked. Yes. Literally, yeah, I, literally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one way of improving yourself. You know, if I can just get hooks and chains to fly out yeah. to wrap people. And then they're pulled into a place yeah. where they have to sit yeah. down and buy the book and re-read the book and review the book. Yeah, that would be – that's a good marketing technique. <laughs> <laughs> I also have to say I'm really jealous that you can handle uh, Google Hangouts as, as well as you do because I still haven't gotten the hang of it. I think a lot of people it's haven't. Difficult. We gave it a shot one time, and it was, it was hard to do. It, I think it's very interesting. It's very new. It's only been around for, I think, less than a couple of years. Yeah. And one of the things I was very conscious of was that I was introducing people to new technology and that I would be, if you like, training people on how to use Google Hangouts to make this work, which is why I put up trailers on how to get involved. So if you go to the Google Hangout page, I'm saying this and thinking, have I put the trailer up on the most recent one? Mm. Um, It's a great tool, and the thing that we run into is that a lot of people do i mean most everybody has a gmail account but a lot of people don't realize that with that they can get into this for free mm. they have they have they don't they have google plus and they don't even know it or they don't use it yeah yeah so that 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 was kind of our biggest cuz we did a like sh- you know share your Clive Barker stuff episode where fans mm. you know fans were supposed to join in and show off their That's stuff nice. and uh, Jose yeah. and I were the only ones <laughs> that, that did it <laughs> yeah <laughs> i, I... I, I, I know how that feels. I definitely know how that feels. <laughs> yeah. And of course, I think the interesting thing about them is going to be interesting to see how I develop it, because what I like about the fact is that you can get people on live, you can ask questions on live questions um, at the yeah, time. Yeah. But there's only a, it's supposed to be 10, but we seem to hit a limit around about nine people, including me. Yeah. As to the number of people who could actually join, because there were a couple of comments after saying, oh, I can't get on, it keeps on telling me that I'm... I'm Full. So I think, and this is one of the things I want to explore, is the idea that if I'm a guest, then obviously I need talking to the guest for certainly for the first half an hour, you know, 15, 20 minutes, half an hour. I think it should just be kind of more of an interview. But I do want to get people online who, can, you know, who are interested in the person who do want to ask questions or, you know, who want to ask questions of me. Yeah. There is, I mean, you don't need, you do need a Google account to be able to join in fully, I think, and also even to log questions in the Q&A app before the Hangout uh, and so on. But, yeah, well, thank you. I, I think we're still early days, and I think it, there's a lot of – funny enough, I think I've got one this weekend. Uh, somebody, somebody else is doing a horror Google Hangout, and they're interviewing me. Oh, cool. I think it's this weekend. <laughs> um, I, I'll pass you on the link when I've actually worked out who it is and when. Uh-huh. Um so I, I'm very interested to see how these things work because I, you know, I, um, I also mentioned um, in the Google Hangout yeah. that I used to do a column called "The Luggage in the Crypt," right, which right. Neil Gaiman said was one of his favourite ever interviews uh, and one of the most interesting interviews he'd ever done. Um, Clive did one. Um, Kim up. Uh, Kim Newman's done them um, and. Whole, uh, Joe Lansdale did one as well, um, and Dave McKee, and Dave McKee, um, and it really, you know, it's it's a fun format, and that's mm-hmm. something I'm really trying trying to work out how I can make it work, and also, you know, if find people who'd be interested in doing it, and people would be interested in listening to, um, <laughs> yeah, just, 
I, I will now just very briefly say I'm investigating yeah. the idea for luggage in the crypt. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to be looking for um, people to interview uh, for luggage in the crypt. Because as I say, when I ran the original series, Neil Gaiman said recently that it was his most favorite interview because it's such an interesting concept. The idea being, I ask people what they would take with them into the life, the afterlife, what books, films, food, songs, etc. Um, I think that would be but, terrific. And, you know, and once again, I would love to see that not only as maybe the the Google Hangout or, you know, the YouTube video, but but also as a, you know, subscription based audio. I think that would be that would be terrific. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I'm really excited about that idea. It had not occurred to me, Ryan. So I think, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that would be that would be very good. Brilliant. Um, so uh, Demonologia Biblica. Uh, <laughs> Listen, why do I get involved in um, anthologies where I can't pronounce the name? <laughs> I know. It's Trace Liborum, <laughs> uh, what is it? Yeah, so... Li- so li- librarian, librarian yeah. Libertorium. Yeah, so it's, a, it's, it's a part of a trilogy, right, of, of books. It and is. I, I, I bought the first one, but I, and, and I've, I've read your story so far, but I haven't read the rest of it yet. Oh, that's very good of you. <laughs> you know, you know Barb, is, Barb is, a, is at the beginning of the alphabet. Yeah, she's A and you're Z, right? That's right, yes. yeah. yeah. Z, Z is for Zizuf? Zizuf? Yeah, I mean, that was a fun thing to do because um, I have a book. I'm staring at my bookshelf at the moment to see if I can lay my hand on it immediately, which is basically a dictionary of demons. Uh, which I was sharing. I was I was photo I was scanning articles to pass oh. on to the rest of the. I think I handed out about two or three mm. different sections of all the different. Uh, it's Fred Gittings is the author off the top of my head. It was fun to do. I, it, it was also it it is something that I keep. I suspect I'm going to come back to and I keep on toying with the idea without giving. I'm trying to remember the name of the actual story itself. Sympathy for the devil. Um, and it, and I think it starts. Uh, it was a cold day in hell. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's it. That's how you have to start. Um, I, I love I love the 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 setting for that. That it's like uh, that. There's the SS, which are similar to the Nazi SS, and and uh, and I particularly love uh, the the setting that that you had set up with um, the the demons and their interactions with the the half breeds. Thank you. I, I, I thought I that really was a really have, cool original idea. Thank you. And this is why I, I wonder if I can expand on this. It's one of the things I'm doing in June. He says gulping because it, it, okay, it was supposed to be May and then I had filming with Backpack. Um, I'm looking to put together three proposals for novels or novellas. I won't say novels, ah. um, which I'm going to give to... Craig and Marie and a friend of mine, Dawson, um, who I just want them to choose one of the three. Um, and that's what June is going to be about, is about writing these um, proposals. I really liked that scenario. I really liked that world. I thought it was a really interesting world. And um, that was only maybe a 15 or 16 page story, but it really yeah. kind of teases something much bigger. Mm. Mm, that that's kind of, that was my feeling about it as well, and I think you kind of explore. And I like the idea of murder mysteries, so it'd be interesting to see what else might come out of that. I'm not putting any; I haven't got anything solid in my mind, but I do rather like that. I'm also fascinated by the. I think I mentioned the Google Hangout. I think uh, Second World War, the Nazis, and what people did and why and how the state can give permission. But Jose, you asked that very interesting question about my relatives in the war. Um, yeah. And, I, and I, it is something I want to explore. It's something I can see myself coming back to, in, if not in that form, yeah. then in other forms as well. Right. Because we often speak about horror in a, in a fictional setting with the supernatural and supernatural uh, events and stuff mm. like that. But... Really, they all, I think, to some extent, reflect our own fears of 
everyday events. You know, we just extrapolate mm-hmm. them into fiction and, you know, create, you know, turn these monsters from our subconscious into actual superhero, uh, supernatural monsters. But in, in fact, they all stem from deeper, more real fears that we all have, I think. Uh, absolutely. Like war. I, uh, another, um, another blog piece I'm working on. <laughs> promised this ages ago uh, to Jim McLeod uh, from Ginger Nuts of Horror. Are, are you guys familiar with Ginger Nuts of Horror? Yeah, yeah. It's very, very good review site and massive respect for Jim because um, he, he, he really is a very honest critic. He likes my work as well. Uh, it's another reason for liking it. Um, but he asked, he's been running a series, The Movie That Made Me and The Book That Made Me, and I'm just putting the, fin- the finishing touches to uh, the movie that made me, which is The Corman Mask of the Red Death. Oh, yeah, cool. yeah. Um, I love that movie. It, uh, it's amazing. I, uh, when we discussed the idea, this title popped into my head, and I said, well, why, why did that one come to my head? And then I went back and watched the movie and I thought, oh, wow, I can see completely how I'm influenced by this and inspired by this stuff. You're talking about, I think when horror works, it shines light into our darkness. Um, Carl Jung um, talks about, you know, by learning about other people's darkness, we, sorry, by learning our own darkness, we can understand other people's. Um, And I think... Mask of the Red Death is very interesting. It's full of moral choices. Uh, it starts with a terrible moral choice um, where somebody has to choose between who's going to die, her father or her lover. Mm-hmm. Mm. And it's like, oh, what? What do you do in that situation? Um, and it is all about exploring desire and sexuality and passion and so on. But in writing that and in, in reading that, I... Imp of the Perverse by Edgar Allan Poe oh, yeah. is still a story that I find terribly, terribly chilling because I think we all do. We all have something as we know what the right thing to do is to do. We know what the best is for us and we know what's best for everybody else. Absolutely. And we do exactly the opposite thing. I think another story that goes with the Imp of the Perverse is The Man in the Crowd. Oh, right. Yeah, from Poe. Yeah. I, I, I mean, he obvious. I think this, he was obviously a very tortured soul, and you can see that in his work, and that's what makes it so interesting, because he, he was very tortured, as I say. But I think for so many of us, it's a very honest way of looking at ourselves and looking at the world. I've not read The Man in the Crowd recently. I, I should. I've got. Fun enough. I was just looking at my complete uh, the, the works of Edgar Allan Poe. Um, up on the shelf, I shall look that one up. The man in the crowd, brilliant. Yeah, uh, it, 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 now that you mentioned that, it reminded me um, of uh, one of your stories in um, your first book, where we mm. have we have a character who does something very very nasty to a cat, and uh, mm. <laughs> I always kind of reminded me <laughs> of uh, the black cat, where uh, the the protagonist uh, one night he's drunk and the cat is next to him and he kind of plops his eye out with a knife. Uh, uh, mm. uh, yeah, oh. it's there's the imp of the perverse at work right there. It's uh, yeah, but but yeah. fortunately, most of us have this filter which say no, you can't do that. That's dangerous. That's going to hurt. Yeah. That's going to hurt people. You shouldn't do that. But it's weird. Yeah. It's like if you're standing <clears throat> if you're standing on a ledge and you just think, what if I just step over this and you know fall off the building or you know. Yeah, and in your mind, yeah. you kind of oh, do experience it to some extent. You, ex- yeah. you try to imagine how it would feel like falling and how it f- would feel like, fa- you know. And you get this sort of chill up your spine. and Yeah, it's really nice. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're almost quoting Poe. Mm. Yeah. That, funnily enough, that's exactly one of the scenarios he uses to describe that motion. Oh, really? that, that moment where you're standing at the edge of the cliff you, know, you really want to walk away, but something keeps you there. And also that um, that comes uh, in the story, The Maelstrom, where uh, it opens with two people talking on a cliff. And one of them's practically hanging out of a cliff more than half his body. And they're looking at this huge maelstrom that creates in this island. And uh, mm. it just reminds me of that. It, it, there are recurring mm. themes all over Poe's work. That That is amazing. Mm, mm. No, absolutely. I, I think... 
you just have to keep on going back. I mean, he's incredibly wordy. He's incredibly literary. When you read it now, mm-hmm. um, you, have, you, you sit there with a, with a dictionary. Um, I should come to think of it. I should really get it on the Kindle because then I wouldn't have to l- l- lunk this big dictionary exactly. around um, when, <laughs> when I'm reading it. But I, it, the imagination and, and, and it exactly as I said, Jose, it's the it's his understanding of humanity. That's what makes his interest him interesting to to readers, I think, and that's what I strive and I, I, I assume every author strives to do. Um, we're trying to show people hold a mirror up if you like to people and saying okay you you probably won't do this but you might mm-hmm. and there's a little voice inside you that said oh wouldn't it be interesting yeah or, yeah. or even worse wouldn't it be fun <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, it's a scary it's a scary feeling and it's good at the same time yeah and i think it's particularly interesting and relevant for teenagers mm-hmm. Uh, young people, you know, for teenagers who are, you know, trying on personalities, trying, like, they do different costumes and different clothes to wear, and they want to fit in, and they'll, you know, the person, you know, the, the leader of the gang who's this, who has a sadistic streak can easily lead, lead other people into doing things because it's giving permission for evil and giving a permission for darkness the reason why we don't do things a lot of the time is because a we think we'll be punished and we don't have the permission to do so because of our upbringing and the laws and our inherent good nature yeah um, this but, reminds me of your story having once turned around uh because okay. you you start out with a character there that uh that's that's driving away from his family Mm. Without I, right now, he doesn't even give them any warning, right, or any any. Uh, no, yeah. and it, and I, I, it's but it's that thing of it's obviously an affair. Yeah, and it's driving away, and whether or not it's going to be forever, it, forever, yeah. it's not really clear in his own mind uh, as to what's mm-hmm. going on. But there's a definite, you know, I talk about the fact that he's going to murder love. There is definitely the feeling that this is the yeah. weekend where he's putting the nail in the coffin, even if he returned to his family at the beginning of, you know, after the weekend. Something major would have changed yeah. in, his, in his, that much is certain at the beginning of the story. If I can throw a curveball here, mm. as a Buddhist, <laughs> and we're, we're going to get deep here, as a Buddhist, what... Mm goes in your mind when you tell yourself I shouldn't do this, this is not going to be good what is your reasoning as a Buddhist to be good? Oh that's very interesting um, I'll say that, I'll, I'll, I will answer your question but very briefly that's the second time I've been asked about my view, the, the Buddhist view mm-hmm. on this um, when it was at the last convention somebody was asking about the Buddhist view of Hellraiser um, in terms of the idea of cause and effect. The Buddhist view is basically there is positive and negative in us. There's a positive influence and there's a negative influence. And that they are constantly at war. And it takes determination. You Basically, you've got courage, wisdom and compassion. We've all got that. We've all got courage, wisdom and compassion. We've also got greed, anger and stupidity. Um, stupidity is a bit of a weird word in translation in this way. It basically means really not understanding, being unenlightened, if you like, to the importance and the interconnectedness with things. Mm-hmm. So in terms, from the Buddhist view, this is being human, that nobody is a saint, but if they are a saint, every saint has got their own de- internal demon anyway. But, that's the view of it, that it's a constant struggle and that it might go either way in certain circumstances. Most of the time we want to be good. Um, I'm pers- speaking personally, mm-hmm. most of the time I want to do well. Um, most of the time I really like to be writing and not on Facebook. Odd how often mm-hmm. I spend my time on, on Facebook um, when I should be writing. I think that perversion it comes back to the imp of the perverse, if yeah. you like. There is a negative side in all of us, and what Jung was saying that you know, 
you have to acknowledge that being a human being is being dark and light. So, yeah, I think that's the Buddhist view is basically it's tough. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I always wondered, um, you know, because my wife is a fledgling Buddhist, so I, I find that we have very interesting conversations, and she's also a physicist, so... Um, oh, yeah, well, that, that's strange. What form of Buddhism is she interested in? I think it's a Shin... Shinto, yeah, which is a, is, is, is a, yeah, is a form of... To say someone is a Buddhist is to say someone is a Christian, ignoring Catholics, Protestants... It's known as the Thousand Teachings because um, there are very many from the, the four my practices the, is Nichiren Buddhism, um, which is a Japanese uh, form of Buddhism. So, I mean, they all come from, you know, they've all got similar uh, teachings at the core of them, but all of them take a very different view as yeah. to, you know, you know the, the way life works. And, uh, and basically uh, about the whole connection I was going to make between Buddhism mm. and physics is that, Theoretically, once you perform an action, it repercusses all through the universe, and it, it never stops. And so I think to some extent that's also mm -hmm. one of the teachings of Buddhism is that everything you're, you're going to do in the universe is going to have repercussions, not, not just on your lifetime, but mm -hmm. throughout history, I think. What we talk about um, cause and unseen effect, um, right. I'm probably mangling that phrase, but the idea is – and it's, it's why the lotus flower – is um, used um, in Buddhism a lot because it has both the flower and the fruit at the same time. Without norm, you know, most things. If you think cherry blossom, you get the cherry blossom. Eventually, you get the cherry. Whereas in a lotus flower, you actually still have the flower, and the fruit is actually still in the is there at the same time. It's the idea that the moment you make a cause, the effect is already there. It just may not be manifest. So oh. I think in terms of the Hellraiser, you could, there is an argument to saying that whole story starts with Larry turning up at Julia's doorstep and then making love on her wedding dress. Right. At the, and that's the very beginning of that story. You don't actually get to that point in the movie until about uh, two of the thirds of the way through. It's referenced back. But that's the original cause that triggers all the other... Uh, events that you see in the movie um, would oh, be that's, one. That's an interesting yeah. point. Mm. Yeah, like, like because that's when uh, the triangle is formed, and that's when Frank yeah. decides that it's never enough, and then yeah. he goes and he tries to find something else. That, yeah. I never really, I never realized that. That's that's really. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> right. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. it doesn't happen that often. It's fun. Oh. It's fun when it happens. Yeah, you got you got the monkey inside my head, like grinding up some uh, some gears here. <laughs> oh, you've got one of those too. <laughs> yeah. Does he chatter to you every so often? <laughs> yes, he does, and then flings things around inside. Oh, and that's another. <laughs> so the last time we talked, uh, you had said that you you kind of decided to focus on writing. Uh, mm. And not so much acting, but it seems that since then you've kind of been pulled back a little bit. That's very true. Isn't it? It, it, never say never. Why, <laughs> yeah. do I, well, you know, why do I think I know what the hell's going on in my life? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> um, it, you know, you think, oh, oh no, that's gonna, oh no, no, that's not going to happen. Okay, well, something else. Oh, okay. I, listen, you know, basic truth. And, um, I'm making this stuff up as I go along. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm really pleased. I'm I, I crumbed. When did we? How long ago is it since we spoke? Per, originally? Maybe a year. I was going to say I think yeah. it was a year. Yeah, yeah. So what happened was that I was asked to do Metamorphosis. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, that was great. Yeah, it was fun. It was a really nice fun day, and it's kind of like, oh gosh, I've been bitten again by this acting bug. Um, so I went and I did a course at in acting. It was evening classes for eight weeks at the um, uh, Royal Central School of Speech and Drama in London and really loved it. Re overcame a lot of the fear and trepidation that I, I, I'd had because um, I found it very difficult. I found it difficult to remember lines mm. I found, you know, because I just not use those muscles, um, if you, those mental muscles, if you like. Because you hadn't acted in 20 years, no, right? No, not at all. Um, yeah. I mean, I've obviously been on panels, which is speaking in public, but that's just in 
revising, but acting, acting, no, I haven't in more than 20 years. So, it, you know, it was fun. So since then, I've done um, did The Day After Dark, um, which I, I just spoke to the producers today, actually, because I knew you were having this conversation. The update on Day After Dark is that they are, they've got a really nice short film, but they want to make a feature film, so they're going to do, shoot another short, another short vampire film this year, and then do mm-hmm. two movies together as a feature, and they'll go into the festivals next year. Um, so I look forward to seeing that. Apparently, um, it's uh, it's finished. I still haven't seen it yet, but apparently, according to the producer, it, it's looking very good. Um, so I did that, and then um, Mike Clark asked me to do Backpack, as you suggest, uh, as you uh, mentioned. So I've done a couple of days filming on that. We're on hiatus at the moment. Uh, not quite sure when we're going to start filming that again. It's like all these things, it's money. But what I've seen, and, the, you know, the few days, it's a very talented crew, and I was up for fi- just up for filming the other day and listening to one of the scenes and when i read the script i thought this scene's going to be heart rending and it is completely i think it's going to be a really amazing film and because it's going to be really amazing they've had everything thrown at them to try and stop them doing it um so i think that's part of the of my philosophy is this if it gets re- if it's really tough and things are really trying to stop you doing it it's because it's important and you really you know, that's a good sign Huh. For saying you have to carry on, you need to carry on. Right. Um, I, I, one of my, I, I was browsing Facebook earlier on this evening, and um, what, somebody had up a Winston Churchill joke, and he said, "If you find yourself in hell, keep going." <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, that makes a perfect wow. good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Well, Backpack had a, had a Kickstarter quiet, campaign, right? A Kickstarter campaign. It was a very right. I, it, um, I hope Mike won't hope. You know, I think they could have done it better to put it to, you know, suddenly they had a whole load of new expenses they weren't expecting. Um, so they have to be grouped. And I think they may well do another Kickstarter right. campaign. So I'm not quite sure what's happening with the finances. Yeah. But I'm really, you know, I, I, I'm, apart from that, I'm um, once. We've got this week out of the way. I'm going to be contacting Mike again because uh, Mike and I hope to be working uh, together on another project. Wow! Uh, on a horror film. Wonderful. Um, and that's our plan at the moment. But yeah, no more about that because we haven't met yet. We've had some ideas. We've talked about it, and it's something we've been kicking around for a while. Right. So, uh, but no, new, no real news on that one yet. So sure. in addition to that, you're also going to be a judge yeah. at the London Horror Festival. Mm-hmm. Yes. Very excited about that. Um, yes. <laughs> I'm also supposed to be writing something and possibly doing another play or something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I promise them I'm going to put in some proposals, um, probably um, for a one-man show, uh, which I'll do this evening. Um, I've got a couple of ideas. Oh, I've wonderful. got two ideas which I'm playing around with at the moment. And... I really just do need to sit down and just think, I've, this is a deadline. I've got to do something about this. Yeah, so I'm playing around with those ideas at the moment. But I'm going to be one of the judges for their short horrors film contest, which is proving quite interesting. I think Claire said on the Google Hangout that they would already had 10 submissions. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, my, just... Unfortunately, my sound had cut out during that That's... whole part. Always the way, isn't it? Yeah. The well, very briefly, they're looking for the two categories, and one is under five minutes, and the other is five to fifteen minutes. Mm. Um, and I think the idea is, make mm-hmm. sure I've got this right. Yes, this makes sense. Yeah, the idea is that they'll get a short list of three, which they'll show as part of the, on one evening as part of the festival, and then the winner from uh, sorry, short list of three in each category. Uh, they'll screen those, and then uh, winners will be chosen. I'm not quite sure of the methodology of that yet. Um, and we're still hammering out the fine details on that part, but that's the idea. Um, and it's just a fiver to enter your, your your horror masterpiece. Apart from the fact they're obviously not going to be able to afford to fly people over. They haven't said that it's UK only, but they're going to have 
yeah, you can find out more on the London Horror Festival website. But yeah, I'm really cool. looking, really looking forward to seeing. Absolutely, this. and we'll put a link to that on the in the show notes. So brilliant, brilliant. And being and being a, a judge also means free movies. <laughs> 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 well, they, what, well is that, I think what we're going to do is I think um, Phil was saying that um, Phil, who's one of the members, uh, one of the producers in, in Hidden Basement, uh, was saying that basically what they're going to do is they they will look at all the submissions, and from that they're going to create a long list. Then they're going to get the judges together, and we'll sit down, hopefully with food and and drink um not necessarily alcohol because we, we're taking this very seriously of course. um but we will sit down <laughs> and we will sit and we'll view them um and then the, the you know so all the judges can sit together and just look at um i don't know who the other judge, judges are yet they, have, mm. they haven't appointed them yet um but yeah so i'm really looking forward to sitting down with a long list and just having an evening watching horror movies um should be really good fun should be really good fun. Wonderful. There was also a uh, a recent uh, meeting of a lot of the Cenobite actors, right? Yes. Where were we? Um, what was the last one we did? Texas. Uh, yes. Frightmare. Oh, Texas. Texas Frightmare Weekend. Texas yes. Frightmare. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, it, I, I'm just really. T- I'm not sleeping terribly well at the moment. Um, yeah, I do see. I, I do see you posting a lot of pictures in airports, and I, and sometimes it yeah. gets hard to track what event are you yeah. going to. So I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah, and I've been travelling backwards and forwards for the, um, up to Yorkshire um, for the filming for Backpack, and just yeah, just not sleeping at all. Well, actually, terribly, not sleeping a lot at night, then sleeping about three or four hours in the afternoon. Mm. Um, anyway, yes, Texas Frightmare. Um, that was oh, that was great fun. That was really, really a good, well organised show. Um, they've been doing it for a number of years. I went um, to the one in 2010. Okay. It. Oh, I thought it was great. Um, Clive Barker was there, and uh, and Roger Corman was there, and Doug Bradley, oh, and and um, yeah, it was it was huge. Uh, it, it was it was terrific. I you know went by myself. Oh, and uh, and people from Phantasm were there. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty wow, neat. That's an extraordinary thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, no, it's a it's a wonderful show. If anyone's near Texas and they've got a chance to go to Frightmare, I really do recommend it. We were we were very well looked after, but also the get the um uh the people coming through the door were very well looked after yeah, as well. Definitely. They've got you know, they've got volunteers who and I was talking to the guys who organise the volunteers, they take it very seriously and they you know, they really worked. But, you know, the guys sitting with sitting with with us behind the tables were really, really good, efficient, and really knew how to help us and also help the people who were coming to the table as well, which I think <laughs> is really important. Um, it was fun. Yeah, this is where I was asked about the Buddhist view of Hellraiser. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was funny. When when I was there, I was, you know, coming down from my hotel room in the elevator, and I was in, uh-huh. in the elevator with Angus Scrim. And, okay. Uh, and I was just on my way to go stand in line to get an autograph from him on my on my DVD of Phantasm, and okay. I was like, I was just thinking, yeah, I, I really shouldn't just hand this to him in the elevator. <laughs> I'll, I'll go through proper channels and wait for an oh. hour and a half in the line. Well, you think yeah. that's awkward? the The first time I met Doug Bradley in Fantasporto Film Festival in Portugal. Uh, I met him in the cinema, in the little lounge area of the cinema where there's a little bar. and you know. So I met him there, and I was like, oh, I'm a big fan. So he signed my uh, Nightbreed Chronicles. He signed uh, um, the picture of uh, Lylesburg, and he signed the Hellraiser Chronicles as well. And I was like, wow, this is great. Wow. And, and okay, thank you. And then I turned around. I had a drink, and then I went to the bathroom, and Doug Bradley was in the, it was in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and here I am walking into the bathroom with my bag full of like Hellraiser and Nightbreed stuff and I look at him, he looks at me and I just went into a stall completely and I was like, oh, oh, oh hello again <laughs> it was like one of the most awkward moments of my life I, for a moment I, I kind of saw this look of horror in Doug Bradley's eyes yeah. like, oh no so <laughs> luckily it, it it became a normal you know, uh, uh, you know yeah. just yeah. We each went to separate separate corners of the bathroom, but that that was embarrassing. I, I'll say it. Yeah, it, it's yeah. easy to yeah. get. It's easy to feel um, to feel nervous and tongue tied. I'm glad that I had already talked to you uh, a couple of times before I met you in person. 
Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but, yeah, and I'll, I'll try, listen, uh, somebody was asking me the other day, I, uh, at Monster Palooza in Los Angeles, um, and somebody was saying, to, I said, you have to understand, I'm a fanboy too. Mm. I, I went to the table of Rutger Hauer and oh, bought yeah. a signed copy of his book. It's misspelt because I didn't have the courage to correct his spelling, and I didn't ask him any questions because I was just too tongue-tied. <laughs> My God, it's Rutger Hauer. I, was, that awesome. at, uh, was that at the Hellraiser reunion in, in um, uh, where was that in? in um... Los Angeles, Monster Palooza. Oh, okay. I was, yeah. The most, oh, no, it's the most recent. It was, this, it was a couple of months before Texas, a month or so okay. before. Because, like, I think last year, two year, last year or two years ago, the, the, the Hellraiser reunion in New Jersey, uh, the mm-hmm. Cher- Cherry Hill one, Rutger Hauer was there too, I think. So, or no, maybe he was at Mad Monster Party in Charlotte. No, he was at Mad Monster. Yeah, he wasn't. I, okay. I'm sure I would have noticed. It's all uh, sort of a blur in my mind. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens at conventions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I, uh, I felt I, that uh, way with him too. That was like. Yeah. Got such a firm handshake. Such a nice <laughs> yeah. man. Yeah. Such really. I, I haven't had a chance to actually pick up. It's on my pile of books that I'm supposed to be reading. Um and it's really hard to read when you're asleep. Um, so, yeah, I'm around to it. <laughs> oh, and, and David Prowse, I handed him, you know, the, the box set box for Star Wars to sign. Uh-huh. And he goes, you're, you, want, you want me to sign a box? I said, yeah, you know, I'm, the movies are in my, at my house, but <laughs> this is the box that they go in. <laughs> he was in and he, he was just kind of like, Offended, I guess, that I had handed him a box. Oh, yeah, <laughs> oh, he's such a nice. I remember, you know, I remember once having breakfast with him in Germany and Robert Englund. Oh wow! Uh, I was thinking, oh my god, I'm having breakfast with Freddy Krueger and Darth Vader. That's weird. <laughs> you, should, you should have, you should have brought for him to sign his uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy TV show. Because he was oh. in it, he he plays oh, really? the uh, bodyguard what? of yeah. the Hot Black Desiato or something like that. And that uh, was I, I didn't. I only caught a few episodes of that. I I, I remember the radio. Yeah, play. it's brilliant. The radio. Uh, that's what. Yeah, that's my first introduction. That's the proper Hitchhiker's Guide. No, <laughs> absolutely, seriously. absolutely. So yeah, should, should we go move on to other people's darkness? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> wonderful. So the the photo contest. I wanted an hour ago. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The photo contest, I wanted to apologize. I I had an idea, and I was all ready to to do the picture, and then that weekend, my dog died, and it was kind of like... Oh! Yeah, he he, he was 17 years old, and we had had set an appointment to bring him, you know, to have him put to sleep, but he didn't make it. Oh! Yeah, yeah, that was a bummer. But my idea was I was going to sit with Joey in in the chair where we read him stories before bed and, and, you know, and have... Uh, other people's darkness there, and and you know, have him pretend to cry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Uh, you, you, have, you, you, have you seen the trailer? No, um, no, I haven't yet. Uh-uh. Oh. oh, well, you what? Oh, shame on you. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in there. You should watch it. Are you really? Yeah. He's in there. Oh, I, wait. I, I spit out on this. Well, I, now we've got a link to it. I'll, I'll definitely be watching. Well, I'm in that. the photo I'm, trailer, I'm, but I'm, not. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you'll find one of the reasons you weren't the only person to have that idea. Oh, right. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but funnily enough, it turned out to be a key idea because it kind of because obviously I just asked people for these um, uh, for these photographs, and I was amazed at what I got through. Yeah, people really, really imaginative. They had, as I had hoped. They'd had I saw some that you had shared, it. and there were some that were really amazing. Of like, oh, I can't compete with that. Yeah, some yeah, some, I, stuff, I, some stuff. The way people stage them, and and people in Chatterer costumes, and oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One of my favorite yeah. ones was that giant bear of a man, like in in front of a forge, holding your book in chains. It's like, <laughs> oh, whoa! I, I don't know, <laughs> what? This is John. This is John Van Pye. Um, who's really who I met in Amsterdam at one of the uh, no, it wasn't Amsterdam Antwerp oh I can't remember um, some European country yeah. um, John is a really interesting guy and funnily enough look at there there will be another trailer 
for other people's darkness featuring john it's not in chains he's actually made he actually made a, a cage. Ma- he is he made a cage yes oh. yeah he made a cage for the book wow um wow. which has sparked an idea so i'm just discussing with him and and, and another fellow so what we might do with that so there's going to be right. another trailer um which springs from that but i was well that makes um, my excuse kind of bad i guess yes. you took the time to build a cage and i couldn't even set up a photograph <laughs> and the forge should... yeah and the forge well, yeah, it's, a, it's a great image it really is a great yeah. image i like yours as well Jose. oh thank you um, <laughs> It, you know, it's um, so. I, I think, uh, funnily enough, that that exactly that idea that you had, um, Ryan. Uh, it was my mate Simon, who I used to work with um, when I was working in computers. It did more or less what you've described. Oh, really? <laughs> and it actually inspired the. It just kind of gave me a way in because I had all these wonderful um, photographs. And I obviously wanted to use everybody. And I thought, well, how am I going to actually make this all make sense, if you like? And it kind of gave me the idea to the the, kicked off the idea of starting it with the phrase "once upon a time." So you kind of get a little bit of a story, not much of a story, but it you know, it does follow through. I had so much fun working on it as well. It was a way of use it of learning iMovie. And I have to say, give a big shout out to a guy called Kevin McLeod, who I've never met, but whose music I use very frequently because he's very, he very generously gives away oh, yeah. um, under Creative Commons. Yeah. Um, I've used his music on some of the videos I've made as well. Yeah, really, really good. Um, it's so atmospheric. And again, it just kind of gives you an idea. I had so much fun putting that together. Um, so as I say, now. And from that, but it, it was just, you know, particularly the last image when you get to it, it, when I first looked at it, I thought, oh, that's, oh, no, I see what you've done there. That's really cool. <laughs> um, and I just thought, and I, I saw Simon's with his boy, and I thought, yeah, that gives me the beginning, and this image gives me the end, and now I can find, kind of tell us, almost tell a story as, as to what these things are. Um, Jose ended up as one of the lost boys. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. I, I don't know what kind of expression I'm doing. I think I'm going for the Mona Lisa smile or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing worse than watching yourself. Yes. Uh, there is nothing worse than seeing yourself because yeah. A, you can't do anything about it. And B, it's just like, you know, that's it. It's there now. It's out in the world. We're, but it's we're, had Yeah, a- we're our own worst critics. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I... And the first, the first, um, the first story of the book, I think, influenced a lot of people on the photo competition because uh, uh, the first uh, story of the book, they're the the character, and we're not we're not going to spoil anything here. But the character mm-hmm. is he goes uh, undergoes a traumatic experience, and that gives him this power where he looks at people's eyes, and if you know. If they're red or, or black or, or, you know, if they start losing their color, uh, then something bad is going to happen to them. And uh, a lot of people obviously went that way with their picture. <laughs> that was my first idea, <laughs> well, too. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And I think the the um, I think this is down to Carlos Castro's cover because um, really they, you know, they they really took the idea. And, and that story was very much inspired by I'd already started. Um, writing and sketching out in my my mind the idea for the story before I discussed the cover with Carlos. And Carlos had not seen any of my ideas. I, I didn't mention he just came up with this image, and I thought, that's it. That's, that's, that absolutely crystallizes what it is I'm trying to say. So it is that thing of the the artwork inspiring the story yeah. um, in that case. And I think you're absolutely right. People picked up, I think, one of the... There's a guy called Vidvad Scare, uh, who I just posted one of his images this evening. And he picked up on the fact that everyone looks at the eyes, but he'd actually looked at the throat of the character on the front cover mm. and taken that and used that, which I thought was very cool. Mm. But, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. People really picked up on the idea of the eyes, and it's right. a very effective image. I just noticed that the throat is covered in words, like like uh, yeah. like pages of a book. You know what? Yeah. This is going to sound really stupid of me, but I had not noticed Ooh. that detail until you told me. 
Yeah. No, it's it, it, it's you don't because you're so taken in by the face. Exactly. Yeah. And in fact, when we had we were looking at the original image, the paper was almost it was up around the face and it was almost peeling off. Mm-hmm. And I thought, no, that's too much for what it is I'm thinking of. But I, I really liked that paper, the idea that, you know, he's, you've got this face, which, as I say, really inspired the story. But there is also the idea that he might be made out of newsprint, that he might actually be something that's created, almost like papier-mâché, perhaps. Yeah. Also, I have the Kindle edition, so I don't have a big book cover to look at. That that was also, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so and the other thing that inspired the story was watching the TV one night, and one of the, we have a uh, uh, we have a Channel Four over there over here, and one of their Channel I dents showed one of the key transformations, um, the transformation that takes place in the hospital, um, the first person that he sees when he ga- when he gains this gift, um, that transformation, just that whole the visual for that came from just watching this. Ident on Channel 4. I've watched the Ident since, and I must just have been staring half-focused at the screen at the time, because in fact the effect doesn't appear in the Ident. But um, that was where, you know, that's where it came from. So this, um, also this, this, this compilation of stories uh, seems to be kind of centered around this theme, the choosing, you know, choosing the darkness. Uh, whereas the the other the other book was about dealing with uh, you know dealing with monstrosity, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. This one, this this set of stories doesn't really have, except for the Miss Elspeth and her cats, doesn't really have monsters per se. Yes, and and, and I was kind of conscious that I didn't. I were, the stories that were coming out were not necessarily around the theme. I'm looking. I'm. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking about the third volume at the moment. Oh wow! Um, and in fact, came up with a possible title, which I won't mention it because I don't know if I'm going to go with it yet. Um, it's uh, you know, titling things is always the hardest thing. I, somebody pointed me at a video of Clive talking on a panel when he was talking about how Midnight Meat Train got titled. Yeah. It was really, and, he, and here he mentions, he said, you know, he happened to have some special cookies made by Simon Bamford, <laughs> uh, which he'd eaten not just because he thought they tasted very nice, yeah. um, and, uh, but he'd had these, um, he had these 15 stories in front of him, all of which didn't have titles. And I, 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 I think this is often the way that the title comes, it comes at the end of the process often. It's really nice if it becomes at the beginning of the process because it's very much easier to write because you've got a clear idea of where, go- where you're going and what it is you're trying to say. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas uh, this title that I've come up with is just a nice set of words but kind of has an imp- some sort of implication. Mm-hmm. And if you think of Clive's short stories, um, one of my favourite stories but also one of my favourite titles is in the hills, the cities. Oh yes, that that one's amazing. It, it, it is an amazing story. I mean, it, it's just and you think, well, that title is a fascinating title. It doesn't really tell you much about the story, but I, then when you read the story, you think, oh yeah, no, yeah, I kind of understand what you did. Yeah, now I kind of understand. But and, and I think that you know, titling stories is a real art form in yeah. itself. Mm-hmm. We were talking about <clears throat> the, the opening line. Well, before you get to the opening line, you're going to have read the title first. Sure. So titling stories is a really, you know, tough thing to do. Yeah. And Other People's Darkness really <clears throat> encapsulates the whole theme of the five stories that are going around in this in this book. Because it's it's like they're not actual monsters, they're people, but they have this darkness inside them that manifests in their life. And it it, yeah. it, yeah. it it's what these stories are about. And, and the and the way the title came about, I was, I know, again, I was just sitting sitting uh, one evening downstairs. Um, I'm upstairs in my study at the moment, but I often work downstairs in the reclining chair with the dog lying next to me because that's where he likes to be. And the phrase with, which actually came to my mind was the reason that my writing works and people appreciate it is because of other people's darkness. I think the reason people enjoy horror stories, and it comes back to a conversation we had earlier on, is that it's called other people's darkness. The other people are ourselves, really. Right. 
I think, you know, hopefully what you guys get from it is the fact that you recognise, you can recognise that this is a, something a human being would feel and do, yeah. because I'm trying to p- touch on... on, yeah. on yeah, and you're right, it's not about monsters. It is about... Because the, I remember going... Yeah, I'm sorry, you're reminding me of that famous line by Jean-Paul Sartre where he said that hell is other people. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, and I came across the Carl Jung quotation, which I quoted earlier on, after the book was published, in fact. But what I'm reminded of is a um, just flashed into my mind is when Clive and I were first talking about the chatterer. And we were first talking about the fact that he'd be leaving in the original idea. He, he's a, like, a, you, you refer to that monkey chattering, uh, chattering in your brain. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Flinging things around, mm-hmm. especially at Yeah, night. yeah. No, absolutely. That's how we saw Chatter originally until we realized I couldn't actually move in the costume. And I went to London Zoo, which is the most depressing place possible. We're talking about the 1980s. I think they really... Mm. But I find zoos terribly depressing because I find animals in captivity very depressing. Was this before they started creating all those uh, realistic habitats and there were still just these cages? Yes. Yeah, and concrete. Uh, Yeah, yeah. But one thing they had done, you just suddenly turned a corner. And what it was was a set of iron bars um, from a cage. It was about head height. And it's probably only about half a dozen. It's probably only about two or three, um, two or three feet across. And it's just set in the middle of the pavement. And you look down at the plaque, and it just said, "The most dangerous animal on the planet is mankind." Oh, wow! And you look through this cage and thought, "Oh yeah, I'm just looking at people." <laughs> yeah. And I thought, that's very cute, but that's very brilliant. cool. I really do like that because uh, it's so true. Yeah. Uh, you know the, the 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 animal that's responsible for the most destruction, reformation, etc. of the planet which we live is is is, is mankind. I've forgotten that story. Yeah. yeah, and then this first story, uh, just to go back to the whole war thing, mm. um, you do have a kind of a social critic here, where one of the characters in this story goes into the army, and and then he goes into mm. Iraq or Afghanistan, and he becomes a a sniper, which is. Uh, mm. Possibly one of the most conscious, heavy jobs you can have in the military because mm. you know where your where your target is and you know you're going to shoot them, but they know absolutely nothing about it until they're dead. Mm. <laughs> so, mm. Mm. and uh, again, that that's one of the that that's a darkness that pervades all this, you know, human nature in war. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, to the point where it actually destroys this man uh, after he comes back from war. Mm, does it? Yes, it does. Kind of. Contributes yeah. to it, I guess. It contributes to it. The interesting thing, the line in there where I talk about, he refers to having had a conversation with somebody who was in a sniper mm. in the Argentine conflict. The, um, the Falkland that's a true War? Story. Yeah. Yeah, the Falkland War. That's the true story. That's almost word for word the conversation I had oh. with somebody. Oh, wow. Um, and in the, and in those days, as he said, you know, it was a smudge, because the the um, uh, the scope on the gun wasn't as powerful, um, and the only way you could it was literally, and particularly in that conflict as well, where you're talking about people who are in trenches and low down, keeping low down to what is a very flat but hilly landscape, and you know everyone's going to be camouflaged, and you just see the movement and. It doesn't. He said, and it really didn't look like a human being. And there is that disconnect. I there is a PBS documentary on over here, um, on over here last night or the night before called "The Rise of the Drones." Yeah, which is all of, is an hour long documentary all about the um, uh, the rise of, of military drones and the fact you know that basically you've got guys sitting in what looked like shipping containers on the other side of the world, sitting with games controllers, mm-hmm. killing them. And, that they, and it, it was a really, really interesting documentary, particularly, as I say, you know, then they find it better to train people who have had no flight experience. More and more, you're making war into a video game. Yeah. Um, I read an article recently, I don't know if it was in Wired magazine or something, about one of the soldiers who used to work for the, the drones, 
And uh, he, he gave mm. it up because he said that it, it becomes very, very stressful after a while, even though you know you're not in a, a plane, you're not really at risk of being shot mm. down. But the, uh, the emotional um, and the guilt and the consciousness uh, of, of being mm. able to make life or death decisions, even with the rules of engagement mm -hmm. that they have, is very, very heavy yeah. on them. And most of them end up having a, a psychological uh, um, counseling because of that. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I think, you know, this is, there are a few pe people, fortunately, who really want to go to war. And really, and this is one of the things I was, you know, that this is the, in the first page, you know, it's a conversation of a 16 year old who doesn't think he has a future in Civvy Street, if you like, or a civilian life. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the military is a mm -hmm. logical uh, choice for him. Actually, I, I, I'll let you into a secret. I'm doing some graphics to share online in, in Facebook. Um, I've been doodling whilst I was travelling up to Huddersfield and so on. Um, images, just in, with taking quotes from the books um, and putting them on a, on a Facebook size image, uh, just using the three colours of black, white and red. Um, and I'll be le releasing those over the next week or so. Is an interesting exercise to try and how can I encapsulate this story into one image without giving the game away, quoting from it, and mm -hmm. giving people an idea of what it's about. Um, that image is the, the image for that story is I'm going to be interested to see what people think about that because um, it definitely comes from those first couple of pages yeah. in the conversation um, about the war and what it is to go off and do do those kind of things. So. The first story is homonymous to the book. It's uh, Other People's Darkness. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's almost like two stories in one at one point because there's also a little bit of a mystery there, which our protagonist kind of solves uh, with his newfound powers, mm -hmm. which I thought was really, really interesting and clever. Um, and I really, I, I really love this story. I think it's, it's one of the strongest ones, of course, of this book. And uh, uh, it really is inspiring. You, I, you want to see it go on after it's over. You want to know what's going mm -hmm. to happen afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and I think it would make a very interesting movie. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. A couple of people have said that's one of the ones they'd really like to um, uh, see made into a movie. But thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, second story is called Having Once Turned Around. And this one takes a, a completely dreamlike tone all through the story. It's very uh, – I had to read the story twice uh, after I'd finished <laughs> But but in a good way. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It, it, it involves uh, a man called Gregory Payne, and uh, he has his own secret life. It, it involves a certain double life, and uh, him and a friend are going on a, on a weekend escape, mm. and uh, their escape is almost an escape from reality. Yeah, it was. It, I'll tell you where. It, I mean, I'll tell you the inspiration for this is. Um, and I was, I've got the book in front of me, and I'm trying to find the actual, the quote. There were a number of things. The, you know, the, the title is "Having Once Turned Round." He walks on like one who on a lonely road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round, walks on and turns no more his head, for he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread, mm. um, which is from the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I right. Quote Cor a lines, and I quote a couple of lines from that. That was one of the, that quotation has stayed with me for years and years and years, ever since I first read the, um, the poem. Um, yeah. And then the other inspiration for it, to try and find a new monster, and I don't want to say what the monster does because that would give the story away. Yeah. But it, yeah. that came from a from a. Um, I was up in Derby at a literary um, day, and somebody was saying, "Are there any new monsters? Uh, can we create new monsters?" And I thought, well, "Yeah, it's a very interesting monster um, and idea." She is because it's it, it you know it's supernatural in that way of meeting something. Yeah, that, that's true. This one is a monster in other people's darkness. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I thought this story is also a lot about is transgression, because it starts with, it starts with this, uh, this man, and he's trying to convince himself not to eat <laughs> a whole uh, box of donuts. A, a whole box of donuts. <laughs> yeah. 
which I think, you know, a lot of us have been there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then it moves on to other aspects of his life that take over. And like, like you said in that wonderful quote by Samuel Taylor uh, Coleridge, sometimes you, you do know that there is this – whether it is a problem that you're, you're trying to run away with or someone who's going to find out the truth about your life or something, at one point you do feel like you're alone in the middle of the road and something's revving up behind you and you, mm-hmm. you, you want to escape. So I guess this mm-hmm. is what this character is trying to do here is trying to escape. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's, tr- he's trying to figure out how to put his life together in a way that he has control again, but mm-hmm. that control is taken away. Mm-hmm. And I think it, uh, there were kind of things, which, you know, this is how I don't want to give the, the game away, right. which I think becomes right. self-evident as to what it is I'm talking about. But I think it's, yeah, it's, it, it's a very human situation to be in um, and a choice to make at the end um, as to what, again, what would you do if yes. this was, what choice, you know, are you going to, um, somebody was quoting one of the last lines of the story and saying it was one of the most chilling things they'd come across because it's, it's interesting. I mean, I'm always fascinated by, you know, reading the blog article, um, one of the reasons I write stories is the fact that, you know, I like telling stories, but it's also the mystery of how people will read the same story, but read a completely different tale, take a completely different thing from it. Um, which is why it's all, you want to do Google Hangouts and, and so on and, and have conversations like this one. Um, it's very interesting to hear what you, you know, your view of it and what you take of it, because it's going to be different. Like I said, I mean, it's a very dreamlike story that I had to read twice, but in a good way. So uh, I just wanted to see if all the little bits would fall into place. And they do. They do. They do fall on the second reading. They do fall into place. And it makes you uh, grasp a better understanding of of what's going on. Cool. I like that. So the the next one is spoilers. Mm. And, And you had mentioned that there was talk of making this into one of the hidden basement plays at one point or the, yeah, or just discussion, first, I think. Well, yeah, I, it was the first one I offered them and they said no. I thought, oh, OK, well, do you want something from the first book then? And they said, yeah, we'll take two of those. <laughs> <laughs> so funnily enough, that's... So this um, was that was before this book was published then? That was before this book was published. Okay. They, uh, Claire got, yeah, Claire got to read it before it was, you know, in one of its very early forms. Mm. Uh, and I've re- rewritten it quite a bit by the time. I, I hate spoilers. I, <laughs> Me I, too. I, I pathologically avoid anything that might spoil my enjoyment of something. Um, but the ultimate spoiler that isn't a spoiler is you're going to die. Right. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hello world. Yeah, kind of. That's you know that comes with being alive. I think we all um, still try to to fool ourselves into thinking that's not the case. Yes, we do. Yeah. And always that that idea that, uh, especially in, in in U.S. culture today, that uh, there is this group of people who is controlling everything, everything you do. They know they know all the secret crimes you've committed, and one day they're going to come and they're going to demand justice. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the it's obviously the. I think it was a number of ideas that playing. I mean, it started with that, the first section where he's having the conversation. Um, that in my mind, I just kind of wrote as a monologue for for an actor talking. You know, um, funnily enough, it's one that Mike Clark really wants to make into a movie. Um, Again, we just you know this is just, I've just I've just promised it to him that if he can come up with the script and the funds, then yes, please go and make a movie of it. I'd love to see what he does does with it. But we'd probably work to, uh, together on that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd quite like to work with him on that. Um, it seems like it, it, it wouldn't take a lot of expanding to make that into a movie length. Right. It could no. it could take yeah. place in a few office rooms and uh, little exterior shots here and there. But it requires some. It doesn't require special effects, which makes yeah. it cheap. Uh, it's it's very definitely a British movie, and set in England. One of the one of the things I keep on coming back to is in another st- short story that I'm working on at the moment. It's this idea of justice that there are people who get away with things. Um, if you think about it, Hitler got off pretty lightly. Yeah. In terms of the punishment that he deserved. Yeah. 
he got off pretty lightly. It may not be possible to punish somebody and as much as he and, deserves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, how, and, and, uh, just look at all these guys who shoot up schools and then just crawl into a corner and shoot themselves in the head. I mean, yeah. obviously they they pick the the easy way out, and uh, yeah. I'm sure a lot of parents would love yeah. to to see him stand trial. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a very human thing. We all want justice. We want there to be a sense of fairness and balance, mm-hmm. and, and and so often there isn't. Um, and then injustice can go both ways, of course, as, as yeah. well, because you know, injustice can go with the, the, the fact that you yeah. have mistrust, you have people falsely accused and 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 yeah. committed and imprisoned and even executed for crimes they haven't committed. Also, I love this part here. It's a very British story, even though uh, even in the structure that controls this, you know, bleep chamber. Mm. But uh, one of the things that I really enjoyed was the the kind of the dry humor. In the the initial dialogue, and and mm. and lines like, uh, "So I said, shall we talk about the weather? We're British, so I think we should." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's funny. <laughs> yeah, I, it was a lot of fun to. I mean, I I think I was rereading other people's darkness, and I thought, "Oh gosh, this really is quite funny. I rather like that." You know, that I think, but it, it, the you're absolutely right. I think if you're in that situation, and I think that particular character in that situation as well. He's obviously, before he discovers what's going on back at the office, he's getting tired of this job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, he, it's not, he's beginning to crack himself. Right. Which is, I think, why he does what he does. You know, well, obviously, the, the only people who don't feel the burden of this kind of uh, work would be psychopaths. And he's not yeah. a psychopath. So and he's not a psychopath. And exactly. It, it, that, sort of, that thing about the weather sort of reminds me of um, – I don't remember if this was in the original uh, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, but in the remake, in the American remake, I remember there was a scene where um, the bad guy invited the good guy in. To be polite, even though they both knew that they were enemies, mm. to be polite, he came in because he didn't want to. Uh, and and just that idea that you know because we're we should talk about the weather because we're British. It's kind of like yeah. it's kind of like pleasantries and and being polite trumps everything, even you know protecting yeah. your own life and. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We should, I, I, I just kind of liked the idea of that situation. You know, there's something. I, I guess probably one of the influences is going to be um, uh, Theatre of Blood. I, I don't think Vincent Price would have been the right casting, because this is a far more modern story, and uh, was a younger man. But I could imagine Vincent Price having that kind of dialogue mm. with somebody. Oh, yeah. Um, sure. You know, and just he, really enjoying it as well. With that Shakespearean uh, flair to it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that, you know, that arching eyebrow. One of the things I really enjoyed was the, the part where this almost becomes born identity. It's it's like uh, I really enjoy that part where he's taking action and uh, you know he's mm. he's uh, doing his best to uh, bring down this this system. And uh, well, that's also it, it, off the record, right? <laughs> this is going to be hard. I'm making a lot of mental notes of where I'm going to be editing this. This is this yeah. is going to be hard. I was trying not to mention any spoilers, but maybe we should go on to the next next Let's story. Okay. Next okay. So this, this two solid flesh. Yeah. Yeah. So the, and the way this one opens is really interesting because it's back to this theme. Uh, Caroline is researching poison to poison her roommate, and mainly mm. just because she's jealous of her, and it's really kind of petty jealousy. Mm. I think, and I think that's that's kind of what you do. Isn't it? If you, if you really, I, I found their relationship very, very interesting um, to write and think about. Um, and the poison garden that I described does exist. Um, and the talk, <laughs> really? that, you know, yeah, and it's a really good book. Um, the poisons in your garden. Yeah, it's. it's, it's I, I don't know how many there are in the in the country, but Craig and I visited it. Uh, it's a place called Annick Castle. Um, and it literally has a garden with poisonous plants in it. Wow. Um, and it's all caged off. And you, go in and you have to go in with a guide. And you. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating because a lot of the plants that are in there are the things that you'd find in most gardens. <laughs> um, actually, 
they will mostly make you ill rather than kill you. Very few of them will actually kill you. And you have to... But I think the reason why they do it is they, they want to show people that it's really good for young kids not to eat seeds and pods and mm. berries because they are poisonous. Um, right. Obviously, certain, you know, some more than others. Um, it was quite fun researching that. And if anybody looks at my Amazon history and research, they're going to wonder what... I really hope Craig is well for <laughs> the <laughs> remainder of my life because <laughs> that suspicious and thrown on me. Oh, it was man. Look for a story. Um, well, I, and I've I, heard that even like rhubarb, you the the stalks are fine, of course, because everybody eats the stalks, but the leaves are poisonous. Yes, yes, you have to be very <laughs> careful with them. And the one that I discovered that really, no, I, I can't tell you because it's in the story. Okay, but uh, I use it in the story. Um, is is the most common one that causes poisoning um, from the, from the garden because it's so easy. It's quite easy to do. But the, I mean, going back to the you know that central relationship, I wanted to write a female character, but I think you know that jealousy, that petty jealousy, can be anybody. It's not yeah. a pure female characteristic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and she she starts off plotting to murder, and then kind of waffles on it. Think, well, maybe instead of murdering, maybe I'll just make her get sick. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I think we've all been there. I mean, it does uh, bring out an, a, a more clear inner knowledge of yourself when you're in a situation like this, and you wonder, what should I do? Because mm. you know what you want to do. Yeah, <laughs> you know what you want to do. It's it's like almost like. Again, the imp of the perverse yeah. that Poe mm, mentions. Mm. Uh, you, you see someone you like kissing another person, and the first thing that comes to your mind is, I want to hurt that other person. But then, of course, the, the part inside you that's, that's sane says, no, you know, it's, why should you do but that? It, They're it's doing... a st- it's a t- taking it a step further, though, when you buy a book about poison. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I do have a five five book series on plants and what they're for, so <laughs> I hope that doesn't make me feel Well, like, it's all in the context. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's it's all in the how you yeah. use it. But uh it's true. I mean some people do go that one step yeah. further and um uh, you know, think, once I, you go that way there's yeah, yeah, no turning back. I, I think it's opportunity as well. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, a lot of people don't kill other people because it's just too difficult to be bothered. Mm. You know, they, they, they can't well, get away with it. They yeah. can't. It's not even that. It's just too much effort to go out and get the poison. And you know, <laughs> we have a lot of murders in the Victorian era because rat poison was, so, you know, arsenic and so on were easily available. Uh, you could just buy them oh, over yeah. the counter. You had to put your name in the book. But you could put a false name it, at, at the um, uh, pharmacy. You had to put your name in the book, um, right, on the on the register um, that you bought this poison. But that's why you had so many poisonings in the Victorian era, because mm. these things were household items. Oh, wow. Um, they were used for cleaning and, and so on. Um, and so that's why, you know, I think, but now it's harder to do. Therefore, people are, so I, I suspect that a lot of people are saved because the intended murderer is just too lazy to yeah. really go to the trouble. This reminds me a little bit of – I don't know if you've read it. Uh, I'm sure probably you have. But uh, one of my favorite books is a book written by Thomas De Quincey, and it's called On Murder Considered as One of the Fine no, Arts. So it's, a, it's an essay by Thomas De Quincey that was published in uh, the 1800s in Blackwood's magazine, and it's a really fascinating book. He writes it in that, in that style, in that British style that, that's – it's very posh. He, he uh, <laughs> talks about aesthetic appreciation mm-hmm. of murder. I'm sorry. So um, I think he, he was inspired by a series of murders that were committed in uh, oh, wow. the 1800s right. uh, by a guy called uh, John Williams, I think. It, it, it was around uh, Radcliffe Highway. So, uh, yeah, that, that is really interesting. He talks about laudanum and opium and all that stuff. And it's uh, Thomas De Quincey on murder considered as one of the fine arts. You must put that up on your, on your show link. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So, and without – we'll we'll see if we can do this without spoiling this one. I mm. mean, we can say that that uh, jealousy and, and unrequited love are a theme and that there's, mm. a, there's a twist maybe a third of the way into the book that, that changes everything. Mm. 
because there are only five stories to play with and try and put in the book. But I think, you know, there a lot of our darkness. You know, we talk about other people's darkness. A lot of darkness springs from passion, from love, desire. Yeah. Right? You know, but the, the want the idea that you want you have to possess a particular person. Only only this person can make me happy. Bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, that's what romantic love is about. Yeah. Um and I, I think, you know, that those are the, some of the things that, that I was kind of toying with and, and, and thinking about when writing this. That but again it's about yeah, it's it's it like the previous story if you like, it's again it's about passion and and if you're in love with somebody that you can't really have, then you don't really have to try or put yourself out there either. Yeah. Because it's, it's kind of a convenient excuse for not trying to find someone. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and it's easier to stay as you are than change in order to get the thing that you desire. Yeah. It's actually sometimes easier to suffer. Um, <laughs> it requires a lot less effort to suffer than it does to actually achieve anything yeah. worth so I think you know, that's part of her problem. Um, and all these and all the characters in this story are almost irredeemable. Yeah. I mean, uh, you have uh, what Caroline. Was the name of, uh, you have mm-hmm. Caroline, who who is who is the uh, the uh, ugly mm-hmm. duckling? I guess she she's the one who's jealous. You have uh, Tanya, who's also irredeemable as a woman because she just uses men as as play toys and she doesn't really have emotional maturity to uh, hold on to a relationship. And then you have Jimmy, who's one of the, well, this is more like a, a square instead of a triangle. There's also another, another guy, but he's almost irrelevant Ooh. to the plot. Uh, and, and Jimmy he's is also uh, yeah. emotion, very emotionally unstable. And he, you know, he's not good at his job and he's very codependent. Mm. So all these characters are in their own way flawed. Yeah, I think they're flawed, but hopefully sympathetic. And I think, you know, Tan, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, she's a bit of a bitch. <laughs> because, you know, that's the word I, I i think if she you know if it had worked out for her and jimmy she might yeah it could go one of two ways either he you know his his nature would you know she you know more maternal and and they could you know jimmy's in a tough place yeah he's, he's not very good at his job but he could get better perhaps he's just not in the right job mm-hmm yeah, you know, he's under a lot of pressure, and, he, and when we're under a lot of pressure, we do you know things, do stupid things. But I, I it's interesting. I Tanya again was a really fascinating character to me because she is a bitch. But on the other hand, you know she doesn't. She still sticks with her friend Caroline. She's still a best friend. Yeah. I think there's something slightly wrong in that relationship and that friendship. I think you know the power is definitely yeah. in one place. Yeah, and. Is something wrong in that relation? I wouldn't say it's necessarily healthy, um, right? But I think that's true with a lot of people. You know yeah. that it, you know, yeah, there are ultimately. people married who really shouldn't be married. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. And there are people who can't get married yeah. that should get married. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, yeah, that was that was really interesting. I really enjoyed this story a lot. Uh, I could see this be a, a movie as well. I mean, that, that would be perfect. Thank you. I think somebody else said actually on one of the Amazon reviews said they could film any of them. Mm. Um, yeah, which is, oh, yeah. I, uh, yeah, which would be nice. Um, but I, and I think <laughs> whereas in the What Monsters Do, I could see them becoming a portmanteau movie. Um, that they you know they work as short. These I can see. Possibly making a you know a full movie out of them, or yeah, at least an album yeah. drama out of them, quite easily. Yeah, and it's interesting that that you uh, said that uh, even though I, I said the characters were flawed, but you said that they could still do well if they had chosen other mm-hmm. ways. It's a very Buddhist kind of perspective, isn't it? Very optimistic. It's like we usually narrow ourselves in. in when it comes to our future, we kind of narrow ourselves into these decisions, but sometimes we don't see that we don't have to go that direction. There's a whole host of directions we can go at any given time, but it's almost like our insecurities, our, our uh, frailties, our, our own character kind of directs us into this narrow path uh, that we can, we can change yeah. at any time, but sometimes we choose not to, or we, we don't realize that we can yeah, do that. No, you're absolutely right. And I think, it, you know, the, the lies we tell our, uh, about ourselves 
to ourselves are the most damning at all. And they're based on our experience. You know, I think it's easy to believe you'll never be a success because you're not a success now. Yeah. Forgetting that actually all success comes after a lot, you know, a long journey. And yeah. most of that journey is inevitably failure. You know, if somebody works for five years to become a success, well, for five years, you know, for four years and all but one day, they were a failure because they weren't yet a success. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. Most of our human tragedy is because we believe we can't change and we become comfortable right. with ourselves. And we, we say, oh, well, this is me. I'll never lose this weight. Well, you won't if, if you right. carry on doing it. I love that definition. Madness is repeating the same action and expecting a different result. Um, I'm determined to lose some weight. I'm going to start a, a, a quiet, drastic diet next week because I have to lose some weight. It's getting silly now. Um, it's because I travel to America. Every time I come back from America, mm -hmm. I'm three stone heavier, uh, three pounds heavier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> you know, it's. But you're absolutely right. That we you know, that part of our human tragedy is that we believe that we are a the people who we're told we are by our parents, our bosses, um, the world, and because you know, part of the problem is as well that everybody wants easy answers, um, quick fix solutions. This is why I'm doing a real crash diet because I need to get rid of stuff, rid of this weight quickly, um, and that's the kind of the world we live in. Um, we don't just want to, you know, just knuckle down and overcome the you know, the things that we have to overcome in order to achieve what it is we actually truly want to be. And the truth of it is, as I said before, yeah, if you're going to be a success after five years, that first four years or so, you're not a success. But you're striving, and that's the important thing. And that perhaps being that success isn't the actual thing. It's the, that actual five-year journey is the thing that you have to enjoy um, and really get a kick out of. Because that one day of success is, you know, nobody has ever just made it, and then it's all fine and dandy from there afterwards. It's a constant struggle for the rest right. of your life. And it's tough to be open to things that are a little bit uncomfortable, you know, like... Um... Like you, you, uh, you had kind of pushed through in acting, and uh, and, and uh, it it seems like that's been a good thing for you now. Oh yeah, no, absolutely, and I'm very grateful for the opportunities to do so as well. Um, I always count myself very lucky, but it's hard, and I and I <clears throat> I never achieve as much as I hope to achieve, or want to achieve, or think I should be achieving, um, particularly at the moment because my energy levels are so down, um, are so low. Um, and it's terribly, terribly frustrating, and I get very angry with myself. But actually, if gosh, honestly, it's like giving this is great therapy. Thank you, guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I should transcribe yeah. this. This is yeah. this is really good it's therapy. You know, the, actually, the energy I spend expend in beating myself up about what I haven't done. If I actually put that energy into doing something then I'd probably get far more done. You know, but there are physical, you know, I do have physical limitations and so on. Being old is one of them. Um, older rather than I was 30 years ago is one of the main ones. Right. Um, but that's something I have to overcome if that's what, you know, if I want to achieve these things. Um, it, it, and it's tough. It's hard. It's a struggle for me as it is, as it is for everybody else. I heard it said once that you have a whole lifetime to get used to aging. <laughs> <laughs> and they do have a point. <laughs> and we all know that all men are 16 years old at heart anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but no, it's true. It's very true. I like that. So the next right. one, uh, Why Won't They Tell Me, uh, is mm -hmm. said in 1883 – and told in the first person perspective from an eight year old girl. So this this mm. story is very, very different from the others in the in the collection. Mm. And it, I think it's a good one to end on. It's kind of it gives you kind of this creepy feeling. Which is why one of the images from um uh, I was so pleased in the contest, the the last image in the trailer was obviously inspired by this one. 
Yeah. And I was really pleased that somebody had, had decided to use that. Yeah, it, it, again, it was fun to do because um, it's fun to think about, well, what's it like to be an, eight, you know, an eight-year-old Victorian girl? <laughs> um, research is interesting. Having to do research as to how they dealt with periods in Victorian times was very interesting. I mean, that's what, that's, that's one of the reasons why I like writing historical stuff and writing, writing stuff in, set in Victorian times. In fact, I'm about to start researching, in fact, I already have started researching Shakespeare's time for one of the novellas. Um, I just, yeah, it was a very, uh, it was a very repressed period also sexually. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, young men were, were introduced to sex by going to prostitutes and brothels while women were expected to be, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Almost uh, sexless. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was weird. It was weird. It was, it, I remember during the 1980s when Margaret Thatcher um, was in power, she talked about a return to Victorian family values. And I remember thinking, oh, you mean hypocrisy? <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. you know, the suppression of women's rights, the, um, uh, the exploitation of the poor and the masses. You mean those kind of Victorian values? Um, wow! Yeah, I mean, it was, it was. I mean, it's a fascinating period because so much of our modern world came from the Victorian era in terms of technology and the Industrial Revolution. Um, it's a, you know, it's an extraordinary period um, in terms of innovation and so on. But yeah, absolutely, um, there are some very fascinating documentaries I have on the TV, which I need to, I'm carrying on watching at the moment. It's all about the Victorian, how they adulterated their food with poisons because they make them go mm-hmm. further, you know, and putting plaster of Paris into bread to make them go further, uh, you know, because it was cheaper than flour. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the fact that people, anybody survived the Victorian period is absolutely amazing to me. Jeez. You know, if, you, if you're in this country and you've, you've got Victorian London, you know, your Victorian stock in your ancestry, it proves that you've got really good genes because you, <laughs> you survived it. Era. It was appalling yeah. poverty. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's a beautiful story. It, it deals with the... Uh, uh, magic lanterns, uh, which is kind of a uh, ancestor yeah. of movies, I guess. Yeah, and I, I also wanted to write about again. It's something that uh, I'm researching at the moment is um, musical, uh, Victorian musical, because um, I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, when I grew up in the UK, we had a program called The Good Old Days, where they recreated Victorian musical. And they sang all the songs, and they did the acts. In- something incredibly English uh, and-, and British about it. This is something that I grew up with, right? You know, as a as a young lad, and a lot. You know, and you've got your Sherlock Holmeses and all those other lovely detectives, and you know, the murder mysteries and so on. All set in the Victorian era, Victorian Edwardian eras. Um, I think these, you know, those are absolutely fascinating. And I've always liked, you know, and I like performers, and I like performers' families, and writing about actors and and so on, and, and the vicissitudes of the the stage and so on. I think those, that's fascinating stuff. I, I was always uh, very entertained by seeing uh, shows where people are doing shadows with their hands in front of the lantern. I have to have a confession to make, which is every time that in my life I've been through a blackout, that's the thing we do to pass the time. We just turn on a lantern and we just do like uh, hand shadows yeah. on the walls. It's something I still do to this day because I, I think that's really interesting. I, it fascinates me. So there's some of that yes. in the book yeah. as well. well. And also what's interesting is you are doing those with candles then if you're, you're, you're casting the light. Yeah, yeah from sure. A, or from well, when I was a kid, we did use candles on blackouts, actually. <laughs> yes, no, and I think, and of course, that's kind of interesting because if you use a candle rather than a torch or a flashlight in American, um, it's a different light yeah. because the because the light absolutely shimmers. comes alive. Yes, it's alive. It's very much a light an alive light, um, and I think that's part of the you know the the um, the thing about sh- um, uh, magic lanterns. 
is the light comes from a naked flame. And therefore, even though you, you do get, as I describe in the story, you get um, slides which are animated because you move one, one pane of glass in front of the other to, make, to kind of get some sort of movement. Again, it was fun researching that as well. The sheer fact that you have a flame casting the shadow automatically animates it. Is it some sort of, you know, a, mm-hmm. a softness? Absolutely. Or so on. Um, I mean, there's, some, there's also something very, you know, very natural. Like, I, I find it interesting in thinking about it that if you want to have a nice, relaxing bath, people tend to do it by candlelight. There's something very relaxing mm-hmm. about candlelight. You had to work by oh, it. Oh, yes. So it's a different matter entirely. Yeah. Well, and yeah. a candle's not going to fall in the bathtub and electrocute you. <laughs> That's a good point, Ryan. That's a really good point. But you you really captured the the point of view of uh, uh, a very vulnerable eight year old girl mm. in Victorian London. That oh, I really enjoyed the story I, as well. As I say, it, it, she was fun to, uh, when I showed it to Marie, uh, my editor Marie Regan. Um, uh, Regan. Um, uh-huh. This is the first. She said, oh, "You've really captured that voice of an eight year old girl." Well, it was really easy. All I had to do was go and read Alice in Wonderland. Mm. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <It> was, <yeah. laughs> there's a secret. <laughs> it wasn't really easy. I've tried to translate that, but it's that. If you if you want to know what an eight year, Victorian eight year old girl is like, go look at Alice in Wonderland. I just had to read the first few pages of Alice in Wonderland to kind of fix that voice in that. You know, in fact, all you need is that phrase of what What is the good of a book without pictures? I've I've bought this wonderful Penguin Classics uh, edition. It was an anniversary edition, and it had uh, both the original short story with the uh, the the illustrations made by Lewis Carroll, and then it had the uh, the novel with uh, the illustrations by Tenniel. And it was really really interesting. Uh, it's fantastic. I really enjoy the illustrations that Lewis Carroll did. They're okay. also very good in their own way. Keep a lookout for that. That sounds absolutely fascinating. Yeah, it is. It is. So wonderful. Uh, that, yeah. that was uh, other people's darkness, and it, it's almost uh, hard to <laughs> to say goodbye. But well, we've been talking the, the for thing over I two wanted... and a quarter hours. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we have a couple. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I mean, even the parts that we're going to cut out, I just want to cut those out, but leave your <laughs> laughter in because it's so contagious. <laughs> so we do have a couple of questions from from people. Um, so Mark Buckle, I know you know him, right? Um, mm-hmm. He he would uh, he said would you consider expanding on look see on the look see story? Uh, it would be great to have more chatter like Barbie did with Sister Celise. The answer to that question is I don't own the right to chatter. Dimension mm. um, Films are the owners of that. Um, the talks have been going on not directly between me and Dimension, but through a third party. Um, and I, funny, I have written another story. Oh, a different version. Uh, who knows whether that would see the light today? I'd love to because I think it's just an itch that had to be scratched, you know, based on the end of Hellbound. Not in the foreseeable. Well, I've no idea. Yeah, go back to the very, you know, couple of hours ago. I was saying, why do I? I never know what's going on. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't see it happening immediately. Right. But yeah, look see is a, a good thing. I had it on my notes but I forgot to mention. That would been that would have been a, an excellent uh, story to have in other people's darkness because mm. that that is the quintessential yeah. Yeah, dark yeah, character, yeah. I mean, that it, comedian it, that uh, gets turned into chatter. Yeah, that was published with permission. It was you know with the original uh, owners of the franchise. Um but that's a, a different company to the one that owns it now. Yeah. Um, so again that would be a gray area. Yeah, by um, several that, degrees I think. Yeah, yeah. So, because I do think about republishing, but I'm sure you can find it on the internet, in the interweb somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know over the years people have typed it up and put it on, have put it online. So, yeah. Oh, we we could put that on the show notes if that was okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think it was my copyright, and that I was given copyright for that story and given permission. So I don't think there's any comeback on that one. Mm. Um, I think the worst that would happen is you just get a cease and desist notice and you take it down. Yeah. Um, uh, Victoria Romo asks, uh, or she actually, this is more of a comment. She says, I'd want him to write a story on how a 12, 13 year old boy got his hands on the box and became the chatterer. <laughs> so 
Well, <laughs> yeah, you did, I, right? I, I, it, it, you set that record straight yeah. and Luxy. Uh, and and I pointed that out and she said she has read Luxy. Oh, she has. Yeah. But yeah, the, 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 unfortunately, yes, I refer you to my previous answer. Yeah. <laughs> she says she says she has read it. It's an interesting take on the chatterer. And as far as Kinski questions go, you must mm. get this a lot, but comparing between the two characters, which one did you enjoy playing the most, uh, Kinski or the Chatterer? Oh, probably Kinski. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, hey, I could see and walk <laughs> yeah. and, and eat, and, and I had lines. And that answers yeah. her second question, in which costume is harder to put on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but at hmm. least for Ch- I suppose at least for Chatterer, I didn't have to dye my chest hair black, which I did for Kinski. So it's all swings and roundabouts. It's all swings and roundabouts. Yeah. Is Kinski a smoker? And if he is, d- does he use cigarette holders, or was that just for the makeup? Um, he he smoked long, thin panatellas, I think. Mm. Originally, the idea was... I think some photographs appeared online recently. Some... Um, I've got a picture of a contact sheet in my mind that might have appeared recently of the, uh-huh. of the photo shoot with Kinski, and he's smoking long, thin, brown. So I'm calling him a cigarillo, mm. um, but that's kind of what... Yeah. I think I've seen that image. Yeah. That, that's yeah, what that's, prompted that's me to ask. I mean, the, 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 the reason why it was long and thin was we couldn't get it near the makeup because it would go up in flames. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's why Doug always has a, a, a cigarette holder when he's smoking his pinhead, because um, it's flammable. Um, right. There was yeah we when we, again when I was originally discussing with Clive and thinking about him there was kind of a Clint Eastwood feeling, kind of didn't really happen. But, but I remember watching Clint Eastwood films to watch how he smoked because that was the image I had in my mind where I said can he smoke. Oh, I think I must. I can't remember. If, I I can't remember if it was my idea or Clive's idea that he might smoke at one stage, but we didn't actually film anything of him smoking. Mm. Okay. So there's a new uh, Nightbreed comic uh, that's out. Yes. I think today. Have Have yes. you Have you seen anything of it yet? I I've seen. I published. Uh, I put something up on Facebook. I've seen the first few pages that they did as a teaser. I haven't actually seen it yet at all. You, Jose uh, and I are going to be going out and buying that sometime probably next week. Okay. Yeah, or today. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, I, I, it's written by Mark Andreco, I think. Yes. I, I mean, the artwork is really interesting. Yeah, it does. Um, and I'm guessing from the from the artwork that there's an implication that perhaps Shuna Sassy is one of Peliquin's offspring in some. That's what I got from the pages that I saw. Oh wow. Um, and that was purely my supposition. I don't know the, the images that. I have no idea if I'm right or not. Are, are you um, going to be buying it? I'm just curious I, to see your your take on it as a as a writer of the the epic you know series. Of, of the epic stuff, yeah. If I, I seldom get down to the comic shop these days, um, and I had and a kind of it's a guilty pleasure to go out and buy comics because they've got it <laughs> definitely. I mean, I you know it's wonderful. I just think it's brilliant. I know they reprinted a few of my Hellraiser stuff recently. Uh, somebody was telling me um, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I, I think that's wonderful, but I think it's absolutely great that we've got new artists and new writers and um, looking at this stuff and doing this stuff. I think that's amazing. And you know, again, just a, a nod to Clive's genius that he has inspired people to do these things um, and take them yeah. off into new stories. Because yeah. he always wanted to write more about Nightbreed and so on. Has always just been very generous and you know allowing people to go in and play with his characters, which I think is very is wonderful of him. And very encouraging for new new talent as well. Yeah, the reviews are coming in now. A lot of people are posting that you know they, they, their issues of Nightbreed number one on Occupy Midian and places like that. So I'm sure we we will uh, we will also yeah. post yeah. our own reviews. Yeah. Be interesting soon. to see what you guys think of it. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. All right. Well, I think uh, I think that we're about that about wraps it up. I was going to say is uh, when does it go out? When will it go live? Uh, probably this weekend. Yeah. In that case. Worth mentioning the Atlantic City Con Bazaar in Atlantic City on the 13th to the 15th of June. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, that's the next time. Is that, that the one with the, the Nightbreed reunion? No, that's Days of the Dead. Which oh, that's I right. Won't... 
bizarre Atlantic City Con is the next time you've got a chance to see all four Cenobites together. Uh, wow. Wonderful. So uh, that's the 13th to the 15th of June, oddly enough, in Atlantic City. Um, you can find it's best. Uh, their website is always very slow, as far as I'm concerned, so best to look them up on the, uh, Facebook, Bizarre okay. AC. Bizarre AC. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll put that up on the show notes, too. So cool. yeah, definitely um, look out for Nicholas Vince if you're in if you're in uh, Atlantic City. Cool. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about uh, all these yeah. projects. We'll look forward to having you again when you write yeah. the third. Yeah, we book sorry of the we meant to get to this sooner. We just have been kind of slow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should we, we should have done this right when the book came out. Oh, look, I know exactly what it's like. I know how gizzy, bi- how busy you guys are, not how gizzy you guys are. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be, uh, as well, I'm very grateful you managed to find the time to have me on board. Thank you very much. Oh, and I enjoyed you. the therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> okay. That's another fine episode. Do you want to do the news? Yes. Um, okay, so we, we just talked with we, – we actually snuck one of them in with Nicholas Vince that the, the new Clive Barker Boom Studios comic book is out uh, today. So as we're recording this today, so there's people that already have it. Um, I don't think that it's going to be available in Fairbanks, Alaska right now, but um, probably within the next few days or a week or so. Exactly. I, I also uh, um, I might actually go today to the comic book store and see if I can find it. I may find stop it. by there, too. Um, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to it. It's written by Mark Andreco, and uh, the artwork looks really, really amazing. Clyde Barker posted uh, a preview of some of the pages yeah. from the comic. And it looks very interesting. I saw Lylesburg in there, so uh, I'm guessing this probably takes place I before think the movie. What, from what I read in early uh, early interviews, it looked like some of it is prequel kind of stuff, and some of it is modern day. So they'll they'll have whole issues of things that happened before Nightbreed, and then you know, and then after. So so that'll be cool. Right, right. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And and you and I have been talking about the idea of our next episode being about this Nightbreed comic. Sure, yeah, why not? So probably won't be a two-hour and 30-minute episode (laughs) when we're talking about one comic book. But but it's something new uh, that's coming out, you know, that's exciting. So, you know, we want to get on it quickly. Yeah, I think it's going to have alternate covers as well, like they do usually for Boom Studios and all these Clyde Barker comics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's going to be at least one cover. It's going to be an old illustration from back in the 90s by Mike Mignola. Uh, the guy who created Hell. Oh, yeah, yeah, with all of the Nightbreed standing around that car. Yeah. Yeah. No, standing around like um, a graveyard. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. And then there will be a new one because this is uh, written by Mark Andreco and artist Piotr Kowalski. And I think that one's by Piotr Kowalski. So uh, cool. you see uh, Lylesburg, you see the giant full moon, and you see all the other Nightbreed scattered around him. So, uh, yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, yeah. Looking forward to uh, having this in my hands. Yeah. Um, so Crazy Face, the play that's being produced in Minneapolis, uh, is has got a promo video trailer. Yeah. It's a little bit freaky. Yeah. It's got an angel up in a tree, and it's got a clown and another clown that chases him with a knife. Uh, and then um, the next one, Century Guild, uh, had an eBay, uh, has an eBay account, and they're selling some original Clive Barker artwork on online. So... I'll post mm-hmm. the link up. Uh, I don't know. Can't guarantee that that'll still be available by the time you know this goes uh, live. But uh... yeah, it's a centipede skull creature. It's drawn yeah. in uh, pen, I think, like a uh, sharpie, and uh, yeah. it's from last year. Apparently, it's dated 2013. It's still going on for the next nine oh, days. Okay. Well, yeah, it, and and today is the 29th as we as we're talking, and uh, the this weekend uh, this this episode will go live. And then I think it's called Made Fire Motion Books has made a deal with Clive mm-hmm. Barker to do motion books of the Books of Blood. So and I've seen like little teasers of motion books on um, you know movie DVD extras and things like that, but I've never bought one or I've never seen an entire issue of a comic book or anything that was done that way. You know where you have voice acting and you have the artwork is kind of moving a little bit to to you know help tell the story. It seems interesting as an idea. I'm, uh, mm-hmm. I, I just saw the picture that has like Clyde Barker's Books of Blood on like a, a tablet. Yeah. 
And uh, I don't even I don't really know how this works. The motion book. I've seen motion comic books. Well, that's what I was thinking. It would be like that. Maybe right. I maybe I'm wrong. Maybe motion books is something different from motion comic books. Yeah, it's interesting. It says yeah. here that um, they will have added sound and motion effects to complement the rich stories these publishers are bringing with them. Hopefully, it's not just the words are moving around while you're trying to read them. <laughs> yeah. So this comes in the uh, wake of a partnership that Madefire did with uh, uh, print comic publishers Archie, Clyde Barker Seraphin, Lion Forge. So they're they're adapting a whole yeah. bunch of these stories into uh, motion comics. Yeah. So well, and that'll be really interesting to see how they adapt every single books of, or maybe it won't be all the books of blood stories. We have no idea. Right. Yeah. I'm sure we'll find out more as it develops. Yeah. Uh, and then this is a small one, but Cabal, you can get the Nook ebook version for ninety nine cents right now. Uh, mm-hmm. So that, and that that's got the fiddle black uh, cover. You know, the black and white cover with the. The, the face that's got the upside down cross on his forehead. Yeah. Right. Um, and I don't know anybody that owns a Nook, honestly. I mean, I have a Nook app on my iPad and I never use it. I either use Amazon or I use the, the Apple, you know, bookstore, but I don't ever use the Barnes and Noble. I think it's, uh, it's created by Barnes yeah, and Noble. Yeah, Barnes right? and Noble's version of the, it's their answer to the, the digital reader. Yeah, it's their answer to the Kindle. Uh, right. But, you know, not nearly as popular. Yeah, it's just like the Zoom. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, yeah. So there you go. If you have a Nook, yeah. you can you can buy Cabal for ninety nine yeah. cents. It's a good. Or it's even a good deal. if you have just the Nook app on a tablet, you know that would work too. Yeah, that was our last. That was the last bit of news. That was the news for this week. Bandwidth for this episode was provided by Jose Letao. Thanks again, Jose, and oh, Joey's screaming in the background there. Uh, and thanks again uh, also for he edited this episode and did our intro, which was pretty cool. And, um, oh, one more thing to mention. Um, the uh, Go to uh, CB underscore podcast on eBay uh, where we've got some posters for sale there that also are helping to support the podcast. Uh, these are posters from my personal collection, and they, um, you know, not only do you get something f- for your money, but you're also helping to keep our podcast going which is kind of expensive because of all the bandwidth because of all of you listeners all right well thanks and uh have a good day you can reach us on the web at www.clivebarkercast.com leave us a review on itunes we're on podomatic xbox music store tuning radio stitcher double twist blackberry and pocket cast like our page on Facebook and join the Occupy Median group. On Twitter, we're at BarkerCast and at, at Occupy Median. The forum is www.clivebarkerfans.com slash forum. Opening theme by Colin Lakativa. <laughs>